Praise the Lord. I am so happy to be able to come to you once again. And God gave us such a powerful word this past Sunday. And so without any further ado, we're going to get right into God's word because God began to speak to me here this morning. I came here uh, with the mindset of doing a certain thing and then God changed it. Right when I sat down, I looked at my watch. We'll get into that in just a few minutes of, of when God changed it. But we're going to go to Hebrews. This is for our main foundational scripture, the book of Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 22. But so much then, Jesus has become a guarantee of a better covenant. I'll say that again. <clears throat> By so much, then, of course, my Bible, the Jewish Bible here says Yeshua. By so much, then, Yeshua has become a guarantee of a better covenant. A better covenant. In Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 19, it says here, He will be very gracious unto you at the voice of your cry. I want you to listen to this. I don't want to rush through these verses of Scripture that I felt like God began to move upon me to highlight. So in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 19, He will be very gracious unto you at the voice of your cry. When He shall hear it, He will answer you. Verse 21, And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk you in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. Then in verse 40, Isaiah 30, uh, 30 and verse 40, every valley shall be exalted. You know this scripture well. And every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. In these two verses of Scripture, the word shall is used four different times. Four different times. So that word shall there, as we know, it's a verb. It's an action ver word. And it speaks in the first person. It expresses a strong intention. Notice it expresses a strong intention. In legal terms, shall is used to say that something must be done. I want you to get that because it has a lot to do with what we're going to be talking about for the next few moments. In legal terms, shall is used to say that something must be done, that something is going to be done. In these verses, our Lord has obligated himself. When God speaks, it is in legal terms because your Bible, and I have said this before, is a legal book. And so you need to write that down. When God speaks, it is in legal terms. Just know this. What am I saying? It has to be done. It has to be done. Verse 41. Fear thou not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yea, I will help you. Yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Verse or chapter 40 and verse 29 of Isaiah. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. In Ezekiel chapter 17 today, I just happened to be just thumbing through God's word. And when I came to Ezekiel chapter 17, there was a verse that really stuck out to me. And this is what the Lord said. 
He said, I am the Lord, has spoken and has done it. And when I read that, that's all I saw out of two pages of scripture. That's all I saw. It stuck out to me like a sore thumb. I told somebody one time that when uh, I would go to a Christian bookstore and if God was wanting me to pick out a specific book, then I would be walking down the aisle and I'd be looking at those books. And the very one, that I, this happened almost 100% of the time. The one that he was wanting to draw my attention to, somebody had already picked it up, looked at it, and then put it back, but they didn't put it back like the rest of them. And it was sticking out. And so the one that was sticking out would get my attention. And as I picked it up and began to thumb through it, then I realized that God was wanting to give me some fresh revelation in this certain book. And so with that said, when I read, I am the Lord has spoken and has done it, it really stuck out to me. I knew God was saying something about that, that he wanted me to talk about tonight. I am the Lord has spoken and has done it. Now, I have taught this before that when God would refer to himself as I am, when he would say I am, it meant in the Hebrew mindset, it meant a definite, deliberate action. Anytime that you pick up your Bible and God begins to refer to himself as I am the Lord your God, or I am this or that, it is a definite, deliberate action. It's what one rabbi uh, interpreted as the eye of purpose. There's, and he went on to say concerning this, as he was digging into this word and then all the, the rest of us that wanted to dig into the word, that we would learn from the rabbi mindset that there is nothing haphazard about what I am does. It's deliberate and it has a definite, it's definite and deliberate action. I want you to know that. And so when we look at the very word, it says, I am the Lord has spoken and has done it. That word has there. Watch this. It indicates possession. It indicates possession in the present tense. The word has, it indicates, watch this, possession in the present tense, describing that events are currently happening. So when God drew this to me out of anything else I could have looked at, any other scripture that I could have read in the book of Ezekiel. This one statement, this one verse in chapter 17, it just, as I've already stated, it stuck out to me so strongly. So God was telling us as we break this down that what he is doing here is nothing haphazard, but he is doing it because he has a mindset that is definite and deliberate. Definite and deliberate. And he's involved himself in it. And it means possession. So what he's doing has to do with possession. And it has to do with present tense. Right now. There are things that are currently happening. Right now. Right now that God has designed for you in this season. I want you to know that. I want you to get a hold of that. Because another interpretation for has, it means, if you look up in the thesaurus, it means to latch on. It means to get a hold of. It means to take in. It means to chalk it up that it's done. And so, once again, before we go any further, God is saying that this is the time that current things are happening for us. Current things are happening. Events are happening right now 
even as I speak to you. And so I want you to latch on to it. I want you to get a hold of it. I want you to take it in. And I want you to chalk it up with an exclamation point that it's done. Yes. Hallelujah. That it is done. Now, in Matthew 21 and verse 22. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. All right, there it is again. The word shall is mentioned twice in that verse. It's the legal language. It's a legal word. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, by whose stripes you were healed. Now, there is a specific reason that I've read these scriptures in your hearing. It has everything to do with what I am going to, if I was to give this a title, it would be the perpetual covenant in thanksgiving. The perpetual covenant in thanksgiving. All these scriptures has everything to do with it. Now, the word perpetual it means never ending or changing. It also means permanent. And it means valid for all times. Valid for all times. The Lord spoke to me, dropped one word in my spirit. One word. And it was covenant. In the season of release, the Lord has given to us very powerful revelations. Revelations that has told us what to do and not do in the season of release. You have heard me and Pastor Angie give you many scriptures concerning faith and that God will come through for you. The reason that Pastor and I can look dead into the camera and declare God's word is because of one word, covenant, covenant. And for a few minutes, I want to explain the origin of covenant. It is because of this, God give, give covenant that we have learned is because of God, all of this, that God has given that we have learned because of covenant, the legal language of release, which is thanksgiving. Are you ready to be surprised? Your release is in your hand. Divine directive in the seasons are released. In Hebrew, the word covenant means to cut. To cut. It has the suggestion of an incision where blood flows. The blood covenant is based upon the oldest known covenant in the human race. You see, the whole redemptive plan swings about the two covenants. We have the old covenant, which is the Old Testament, and the new covenant, which is the New, new Testament. The reason for cutting the covenant were... If a strong tribe lived by the side of a weaker tribe and there is danger of the weaker tribe being destroyed, the weaker tribe will seek to cut covenant with the stronger tribe there that they may be preserved. If two businessmen entering into a partnership they might cut the covenant to ensure that neither would take advantage of the other. Two men wish to cut the covenant would come together with their friends and a priest. First, they would exchange gifts. By this exchanging of gifts, they indicated that all that one has the other owns if necessary. Right. Now pay attention. After the exchange of gifts, they would bring a cup of wine 
to the priest. Then the priest would make an incision in the arm of one man and the blood drips into the wine. An incision is made in the other man's arm and his blood drips into the same cup. Then the wine is stirred and the bloods are mixed together. Then the cup is handed to one man and he drinks part of it. Then he hands it to the other man and he drinks the rest of it. When this is done, they will put their wrists together so that their blood mingles or they will touch their tongues to each other's wounds. Now they are considered blood brothers. Now this blood covenant is so extremely sacred that if one was to break the covenant, now listen, his own mother or wife or his nearest relatives would seek his death. The family would turn him over to the hands of the avenger for destruction. The one who breaks the covenant curses the very ground he walks on. Now, the vilest enemies become trusted friends as soon as the covenant is cut. You see, it is the covenant. It is much more than a promise. Yes, it is. Covenant is a total commitment. Yes. Total commitment. An absolute requirement. It is an absolute requirement to do or not to do, even at the cost of one's life. Everything I have is yours. That's what the covenant says. One needful requirement for covenant is blood. It is an essential element in covenant. The blood of circumcision is necessary as well as immersion, which is symbolic of dying to self and coming. Watch this now. Dying of self and coming out of the. Watch this very carefully. I want you to, I want you to hear what I'm fixing to say. Let me just, the blood of circumcision. is necessary as well as immersion, which is symbolic of dying to self and coming out of the, watch this, amniotic fluid as a new creation. Maybe I need to say that last part again. It is a dying of self, immersion, and coming out of the, watch this, Amniotic fluid as a new creation. That's deep stuff. And as I said, it is so sacred that the children to the third and fourth generations reverence it and keep it. It is a perpetual covenant. A covenant that cannot be annulled. In Genesis Chapter 15, oh, I'm feeling the presence of God coming upon me right now. In Genesis chapter 15, God made a promise to Abraham. And it says this, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. The word believe there meant Abraham made an unqualified committal. He made an unqualified committal of himself and all he was or ever would be to God. But the word believe means more than just a loving trust. It also means to give yourself wholly up or to be a part of himself or go right into him or the unqualified committal. Abraham gave himself to God 
in utter abandonment of self. God's word is composed of two covenants, two contracts, two agreements. In the old covenant, everything centered around the high priest. And in the new covenant, everything centers around our heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ. Jesus, as we just read a few moments ago in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 22, he is our personal surety. Or Jesus is our personal bondsman. Or he is our personal assurance. Or he is our personal confirmation. This is found in Hebrews. This is the most vital of all manifestations of our God. And I'll say it again like this. This is the most vital of all ministries of our Lord. Is Jesus is our personal surety. He is our personal bondsman. Or let me just make it personal for you. He is your personal surety. He is your personal bondsman. He is your personal assurance. He is your personal confirmation. And this right here is the most vital of all the ministries of our Lord. Our new covenant came into existence by the blood of Jesus. You see, when we give our life over to Jesus, we are telling him, I give myself wholly up to you. We enter the unqualified committal. Now, everything we do is centered around our great high priest. That's why the Lord told Israel, that old generation from the get-go, that you are to love me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the same goes for us in this present time, that we are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and that we are to continuously put him first. That when it comes to making a major decision in your life, that your first obligation is to talk to Jesus about it. And I might add, be prepared for him to, that he might tell you no. And I just want to stop right there because it came to me early today what the statement I just made to you, I felt like God dropped that into my heart because he did say, blessed is those who are not offended in me. Right. And you see, here's the thing. God knows further down the road than we do. Right. And sometimes what we think will be great, that I need to go with it. God will look at it and say, no. Because you have to understand, God is not against you. He is for you. And when you turn your life over to Jesus, you are giving your life, your present life, your future into his hands. And so he takes that. You come into covenant with him. And so therefore, you have to Always remember that when you go to God, you have to have an open mind. There's been so many times, Pastor and I, we've got to talking about through all of our ministries together and all these years of being in this city. There's been many times that people have come to us and they really didn't want to hear us say, thus saith the Lord when they would begin to lay out before us what was on their mind, we could tell that they already had their mind made up of what they were going to do. And they just was interested in us coming into agreement with us, with them. And so when we would pick up on that, we would just end it right there and say, there's no point in going any further. In the majority of the time, well, let me back up, 100% of the time, when we do something that God knows we should not do, it's always going to bite us in the south end. 
always. I know that's kind of a country boy language, but I believe you understand it. It will always bite you in the south end. And so when you start praying, and see, here's another thing. You don't get your heart in it, then you start praying about the will of God. Because you'll end up fighting God. And you'll want, you will not want to hear the, no, the word no. And if you want God, remember what I'm fixing to say. If you want God to open a door, you have to be willing for Him to close the door. Because He will never allow us to walk through a door and leave it open and walk through another door. No, sir. He's going to shut the door. And you have to be willing for Him to shut that door. Is it possible that I am talking to somebody now that you have been praying about a particular thing and you've been wrestling with it and you know God has talked to you about it. And so therefore, there is a door that you have left open that God has been telling you He wants to shut it. And so by you leaving that door open, it has caused con some confusion. It has caused you to... Because I have learned the longer that you wait on obeying God, the more confused the enemy will cause you to become. When God moves upon you, you have to obey. You have to obey. And here's another thing that you need to put in your bag. Here's another key. The Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. And you need spiritual headship that is used by God that you can talk to and be open-minded to the will of God. To the will of God. I remember many, many, many years ago, there was a particular, particular brother that came to us. And as I dig into this story, he'll know exactly who I'm talking about. But he was in a dilemma. They needed money really bad. And all they had was, they were just eating cans of beans. And so he came to Pastor and I, and he sat down and began to talk to us. And he had been offered a job, a certain job. And he needed it desperately because he understood that the scriptures has told all of us that if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an infidel. So he was feeling the pressure, feeling the pressure of needing financial increase. And so as he laid it out, pastor and I looked at him and we asked him one word. We said, or once we asked him one statement. Will this keep you out of the house of God 90% of the time? He said, yes, it will. And we said, it's not the will of God for you to take this job. And right then, he fell to the floor. Tears began to roll down his cheeks like a Niagara. But he accepted the no. And it wasn't long till something much, much better opened up for him. And now God has blessed him and has moved him up on this job and made him one of the high bosses and has given him a lot of favor. And God began to bless him because he was willing for God to shut one door so that God could open up another door. And I feel the anointing upon me. I am talking to somebody now. You need God to shut that door. Because there's another door that is much better that God is waiting to open. But He's not going to do it until you submit to the voice of God. You have to submit to the voice of God. You have to trust Him. We're talking about covenant here. Covenant here. Now, let me continue. Everything we do, I've already said this, 
is centered around our great high priest. And everything, watch this, this is what I like. Everything he does is centered around us. Covenant. Everything that we do is supposed to be centered around our great high priest, Jesus Christ. And everything that he does is centered around us. That is covenant. In Isaiah, he told us, I have engraven you in the palm of my hands. Every scripture we read that tells us God will do for us stems from covenant. The sole reason we read that it's impossible for our Lord to lie to us is because of covenant. So hear what I'm saying. You have heard me talk about faith. A lot of these keys that Pastor and I has been given you in the season of release has been wanting to encourage you and lift your faith and believe that what God tells you in His Word, He will do it. And so God moved upon me at 20 minutes to 11 this morning and tells me to tell you Those of you that are watching, that are listening, those that will be watching and listening later during the week, that everything is centered around covenant. That is why that it's impossible for God to lie. That is why when you read that God will be with you, that you can take that to the bank. When you read scriptures that God will heal you, deliver you, touch you, that will bring deliverance, that will increase you in every area of your life. Friend, you can believe it because it centers around covenant. And when we understand fully of the word covenant, then we know that God will come through to his word. That when he speaks to you, that it is going to happen. It is going to happen. Oh, my Lord. Let me get this verse again. In Ezekiel chapter 17, the Lord tells us, I am the Lord has spoken and has done it. That's what he's saying. That's what he said. This has to do with covenant. What does the word has mean? Indicates possession. Possession. In the present tense, Describing that events are currently happening. There, as I've already said, there are things that are happening right now. You may not be able to see it, but it's happening. And it all centers around one word, and that is covenant. 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 So I encourage you to latch on, as I said here, to get a hold of, to take in, and to chalk it up. That it is done. Exclamation point. We can tell our Lord, thank you in complete faith that everything he's told you he is going to do. He has already done it. Hallelujah. He has already done it. So it's because of this covenant as I've stated, that when you rise up tomorrow, that you need to rise up tomorrow and say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Because it is done. Because you're speaking from the platform of covenant. Covenant. So once again, you ask, why am I so confident? What have I been saying? It's because of covenant. One word, covenant. I hold God's word. This is covenant. It's a legal book, legal language. That means God has spoken. We are to receive it and say it's done. And remember, 
Keep your head up. Keep your napkin in your hand. Keep your knees bent. And with God, it's always cloudy with a chance of quail. May God richly bless you and keep you.